Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here this afternoon. Again, I'm Bill Kearns. I'm from the University of South Florida in Tampa. And I just wanted to talk to you about two projects which we have underway down at the University of South Florida in association with the uh, James A. Haley Veterans Administration Hospital. One of the uh, projects that we have underway is a polytrauma transitional rehabilitation uh, program, Smart Home, which has a tracking system installed in it, which is based on ultra wideband. Um, we're not going to go into a lot of detail about it, but imagine a global positioning system that actually works inside of a building and can provide you with, say, positional accuracy on everybody in this room right now with an accuracy of about six inches. This gives you some idea of the type of uh, capability that we're talking about. The smart home system, which is derived from the tracking information used, uh, was born in this clinical polytrauma facility. It provides support for activities of daily living. We have about uh, 40 panels throughout the facility, which are kind of like iPads on the walls that deliver prompts. These are uh, essentially prompts for ADLs, such as take your medication. It's time to go to, say, room 105 for your therapy appointment, et cetera. And these are delivered uh, the information is delivered contingent on where the individual is standing. So if you have to be standing at or near one of the panels for it to deliver a prompt to you. And it has to be contingent not only on your identity, but time of day and your schedule, as well as a number of other factors. Anyway, we have also taken data from the tag that the individual wears, and I'll just hold up one of these. There, uh, the ultra-wideband tags are only about an inch on a side and about a half an inch in thickness. They weigh about uh, 40 grams, to give you some idea. There's a small wrist strap that feeds through it. It's used on the wrist as this, or it can be placed in the back of a person's uh, identity badge, because all the patients wear one of these, and they also have an RFID tag, which is used to unlock the door in the facility so that they can enter and exit into their uh, bedroom. So to give you some idea that it's kind of part of an overall system. We also have within this system uh, linked sensor data coming from medication boxes, uh, water sensors, etc. So this tracking system can give us information about whether or not a person actually complied with what they were told to be told to do. So if we tell you you need to go to room 105 for your appointment, we can actually see if you went there because we can follow the tag. We know exactly whether you went there and how long it took you to get there, and we can develop measures of compliance, which can then be referred back to other variables which we're going to go into. So there's a lot of different things that we can get from these different sources of sensor data and positioning data, but there's also a bit more. There's really some buried treasure encapsulated in those data. Now, the real-time location systems, the RTLS here, uh, is more than just providing the identity of individuals or information about how fast they walk or the direction that they take because we can get that information from that tag because again it is like an aircraft transponder if you want to think of it think of it like the the individual transponders on airplanes when they come in to um, the Vancouver airport it helps the air traffic controller keep track of exactly who is who so we get that and timing information. But for over 50 years, for over 50 years, police have known that short-term cognitive impairment is revealed in walking patterns or the patterns of movement of individuals in field sobriety tests. So to give you some idea of what we're talking about here, we have this handy little clip. And hopefully with the audio will be loud. In Ohio, a state trooper is trying to stop a suspected female DUI in this SUV. Motorists suspected of driving under the influence, DUI, are routinely asked by police officers to perform one or more field sobriety exercises. The woman aroused suspicion when her car was seen veering all over the highway. It seems like this woman has no idea that the patrol officer has been following her for quite some time. How much you had to drink? Not at all. Not at all. All right. Get your insurance card with you? Yes, sir. With the woman's vehicle finally stationary, the officer wants to begin with the sobriety tests. But before he can, 
the woman decides that she needs to retie her shoelaces. Whoa, 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 don't go over on me. The officer finally starts his test, beginning with something easy. He asks her to walk in a straight line. Just like that. Keep your arms down at your side. What I want you to do is take nine heel to toe steps, just like this. One, two, three, all the way to nine. Stand that. When you're ready to begin, go ahead and begin. The officer has seen enough, and as soon as he began, he stops the test. Go ahead and turn around for me. Can't turn your back. Back, back, back. The woman is arrested for operating a vehicle under the influence of alcohol. Under arrest for OVI. Okay, so what you just saw there was a case of an individual weaving all over the highway, but also, as you can see, walking and weaving all over the street, even as they're walking. So, one of the things that we're trying to do here, let me just return to our presentation, is we are actually doing this same kind of test, if you think about it, each time that a person moves about within our smart home. Again, we have a transponder on each of the individuals, and we can get highly accurate data as often as 10 times per second if we want. We typically do an update rate on this at about once per second. But instead of using a cop, we're using the real-time location system, the tracking information on the transponder. And we have also borrowed a mathematical technique called fractal dimension as a way of studying the straightness of the walk that an individual makes. Now, fractal dimension is basically a, a study of lines or the straightness in, of them and uncorrelated turns. But it turns out that you can use this directly on the tracking data coming from the, the tag. Now, fractal D, as we call it, ranges from 1.0, which is a perfectly straight line, which almost never is seen in nature, to a value of 2.0, which is a drunkard's walk. It's actually what it's called. And what we find when we begin to look at the data that gets generated from this is some very interesting things. One of the things that I should mention is that fractal D was created or I should say has been used extensively by animal ecologists. In fact, our, one of our associates is a Dr. Villas Nams at uh, Dalhousie University, uh, who has been using fractal dimension for many years to study oriented behavior of animals in the wild. So effectively, what we've done is been to go from a GPS-type environment like he's using down to a micro-scale GPS within a building. So these are two examples of two women occupying the, the same physical area over a period of one hour, beginning at 9 a.m. on a, a specific day. You notice any difference between these two? Okay, the red, the red circles here denote the sensor placements. Uh, we only use four sensors in this particular study. It's one of our earliest ones. The uh, lady in the top had a fractal dimension value that was calculated at 1.2, which is a fairly straight path. Uh, she had an MMSE of 25, which is in a normal range. The individual in the lower panel, as you can see, a lot more walking and a lot more <coughs> variable walking, she's really all over the place, had a fractal D of about 1.4 and an MMSE of 21. So one of the questions we had was, now that we've seen this phenomena in assisted living facility uh, residents, what could we possibly see if we turned our new instrument toward people with traumatic brain injury? And the Polytrauma Transitional Rehabilitation Program Smart Home provided us with an avenue to collect a lot of data on a lot of people over a very long time. So in this case, we followed 22 veterans over a period of greater than four months. And we found that over the ten month, or four months, uh, 10 of these individuals had a drop in fractal D over that period, and 12 did not. We found that the 10 that declined had a significantly better clinical outcome on the Mayo-Portland Adaptability Index than the individuals who did not change. The Mayo-Portland Adaptability Index is the primary clinical measure uh, that is used in the Polytrauma Center. 
Uh, we published these results this month, as a matter of fact, in the Journal of Head Trauma Rehabilitation. This is an example of one of the veterans with polytrauma in the polytrauma center who had TBI who declined over a period of four months. The line through the center is the mean, which in his case was about a 1.42. But not everybody drops. As you can see, in this case, there's another person who didn't change at all over that period of four months. So he'd be one of the individuals who we would expect to have done more poorly on the clinical measure. Now the implications of this are very interesting in the sense that there really are no really good reliable biomarkers for recovery from traumatic brain injury because it's such a diffuse and variable uh, type of injury. There are many different uh, cognitive functions that can be uh, implicated if an individual gets struck in a particular area of the head. But one of the things about fractal D is that it's relatively easy to get. If you have a tracking system that can give you reasonably good accuracy, such as the ultra-wideband system we're using, it kind of comes along with the deal. We also found in a later study that fractal D that we took from just using uh, GPS logging devices, these are devices that are actually just about this big, actually a little bit larger, um, was recorded at the time of admission of another group of veterans into the polytrauma center. And we were interested in the predictive validity of this measure in terms of what it said about people's ability to benefit from the very prompts that they were being given. Now, you know, it's kind of taken as a, an article of faith that if you give somebody a, a prompt that it's going to necessarily help them or somehow help an individual with cognitive impairment. At least that's the general philosophy at the VA because when people get released from the polytrauma center with TBI and sent home, they're typically given apps and a, and a smartphone and these types of things and with the hope that it'll help them remember to take their medication and so forth. So we were very interested in seeing whether or not fractal dimension as it was recorded from these GPS loggers might tell us something about how well people might do over the course of the recovery while they're in the polytrauma center. And the findings from that, we also published this month in a second paper in the Journal of Head Trauma Rehabilitation. So we've been kind of busy this month. It's been a good one for us. This is uh, a graph of the data from these 10 subjects. And it's very interesting and I think fairly clear cut that individuals who have a fairly high fractal dimension values at the time that they're admitted into the polytrauma center don't do very well with prompts. In fact, the likelihood that they're going to do what the prompting device tells them to do drops substantially with the higher the value. So this is, again, more ammunition, if you will, toward fractal D being reflective of changes in cognition. So we understand that people can come in with severe polytrauma and that they can get better over a period of time as the TBI resolves, hopefully, but that if it doesn't resolve, there are some significant implications for how well they're going to be able to do, uh, to do at home with devices that provide prompts on apps or other uh, wireless devices. So again, our indications from our research is not everybody's going to necessarily benefit from these types of prompting devices. Maybe fractal D might be one way that we could help figure out who is likely to benefit from it. And maybe it, it may also serve as a way for us to guide our engineering of new technologies. I mean, if you can categorize people as having a particular fractal D value, you can redesign your interface so that it works better for those people. In other words, don't go with a one size fits all. So I want to close with some of the individual applications, the ADL prompts and the like, that we're currently using within the smart home system and we have migrated to four homes in the community. Before I do, I just wanted to call attention to our collaborators in the project, Stephen Scott, who is the Chief of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitative Services at the James A. Haley uh, Veterans Administration Hospital, is the, uh, is the PI on the project, and as is Jan Jasowitz, is the director of the Smart Home Project, and Sam Phillips, who will soon be taking over his role. 
the, again, the, some of the uh, strategies that we're trying to do is uh, to promote safety, to provide prompting as a cognitive prosthetic for individuals by providing verbal prompts and ADL instructions, and also provide reports and analytics for the clinical staff in the facility. This gives you an idea of the monitoring and analysis central core that, and the sources of data which typically feed into this, whether it's calendaring and prompts for appointments, et cetera, uh, the provision of sensor data into the system, and the types of outputs that can be derived, whether they're from a web page uh, report, which a clinician can review, an app on a dedicated tablet, or some electronic mail or text that can be sent to a clinician who needs to attend to one of the patients. These are, again, some of the different features, such as overall activity level, social interactions, in this case because the clinician and the person who is, uh, has the TBI have both worn tags. We can tell, actually, the physical distance between two people. How much time do you spend within three feet of somebody? So if you're interested in doing follow-ups and seeing what the level of social interaction <laughs> is, that's one way of getting at it. Medication compliance, because we're dealing with med boxes that will tell us when the box has been opened and the medications have been taken. In my study of the compliance, we also looked at whether or not the patients went to the nurse's window to be observed taking the medication. So we knew physically that they actually went there. Whether or not the individual has showered recently. We have water sensors, for example, which are picked up by the, uh, by the system and reported in. Residents entry and exit. How much time do they spend going out in the community and so forth. Physical exercise whether or not they've been out and, uh, and physically working out. And overall movement. There are a couple of others, like appointments attended, which are quite important, values of fractal D, et cetera, but I'm not going to go into those. We, of course, are capable of generating a full weekly report for each of the patients in the facility, which we do on a regular basis for the clinicians. And this is just an example of what one of the screen client interfaces looks like. So we have been gathering data at this time on four uh, patients' homes in the, in the uh, area. It, with, this is largely in uh, development, so we don't really have a lot of data aside from the fact that we have some basic satisfaction data, which in indicates that the veterans are quite pleased with it. Uh, it's been generally high, but again, it's not conclusive. So just in conclusion for the uh, study, uh, the tracking technologies provide us now with an unprecedented opportunity to gather a lot of information on the rehabilitation process and improve home-based care. These generally tend to be low-hanging fruit. You, know, you, can, uh, you can develop algorithms and mathematical techniques to extract very interesting pieces of data like Fractal D, uh, which may be a reasonable biometric for helping track recovery from polytrauma. We're also interested in gathering all the collaborators we can on this. This is a big project. We generate multiple gigabytes of data in short periods of time. So it, these are good problems to have. This is my contact information, and I thank you very much for listening. <laughs>